Before beginning with the Darcy's law, it's very important to understand the three important types of fluid flows and then we understand that Darcy's law is applicable only to a laminar fluid flow. So let's understand the three fluid flows first. The first one is the laminar flow. Now what do we mean by laminar flow? Laminar flow simply means that the fluid would have a constant velocity constant pressure and a constant density at a given point. So within the fluid at a given point you would have all these properties that would remain constant the various parameters and therefore you would have a laminar flow that would be seen. However in a turbulent flow what would happen be it the velocity pressure or density it would vary at a given point and at each of the points within the fluid and therefore this movement would be called as a turbulent movement and the third is a transient movement transient movement means these properties that we have discussed so far they change with time due to the change in the status of the system and therefore we call it a transient flow so whenever we are considering Darcy's law, it's very, very important that we are focusing on a laminar fluid flow. So when you have at a given point, there is a constant rate of velocity, pressure or density that is seen, we call it a laminar fluid flow and Darcy's law is applicable in a laminar fluid flow. But there are certain exceptions that we would understand in a while. Now, there is another important thing that we need to understand which is the Reynolds number. Reynolds number is a dimensionless property. What do we mean by that? You have the ratio of inertia to the viscous forces that are there and this ratio when it is low we say that there is a laminar flow. So whenever you have a laminar flow with low Reynolds ratio you would have the Darcy's law that would be seen applicable. However if this ratio is high then it would be considered as a turbulent flow. Now Darcy was a French engineer and what he tried to do was he used this principle to understand the filtration. So sand filters was the concept that he was trying to work on and the rate of flow of water through those sand filters. But later on this law became highly applicable to groundwater flow and there were two components that were seen. The one was the direction, the other was the amount of flow. To understand it, we have a very simple demonstration here. So we have a tank full of sand and then you have two pipes that are connecting it. One is the inlet pipe, the other is the outlet pipe. You have certain amount of water in the inlet pipe and certain amount of water in the outlet pipe. Now, what would be the direction of flow? That was the first problem that Darcy tried to solve. So it was simply when you have a sand filter with the input and the output, a simple principle that works with water is water flows from higher elevation to the lower elevation and from higher pressure to the lower pressure. So you had two components that were taken into account. One was the datum line and the elevation head that was considered on both the sides. And then next was the pressure component that was taken into account. So let's say the elevation component, component in the first case remains same for the inlet as well as the outlet. So the only change would be seen with the pressure component and you would have a higher pressure, pressure component with the inlet and lower pressure component at the outlet. So what would happen if I am trying to put a blue color dye in the sand at this point, what would be the direction of the flow of that dye? Since you have higher pressure and lower pressure, higher head gradient and lower head gradient, you would have the movement that would be seen in this direction and therefore you would have the dye that would slowly and gradually start moving towards this direction. And this is how we understand the direction. So this was the first and the very simple case. Now what I do is a little interesting scenario where I tilt this uh, sand tank and when I'm tilting this tank of sand what is happening is I am again considering the elevation head and the pressure head. So together note it's very very important let's say this is the direction of the tilt that is seen. Now if you have the input that is higher than the 
output. So my input is this point and output is this point. So always, despite that the slope is in this direction for the sand tank, the movement of the water or the direction of the flow would be opposite to it in this scenario because you have higher pressure gradient and higher head gradient that is seen in the outlet as compared to the inlet. So that is a very, very important component that you need to understand. However, uh, it's good if you have both the slope of the tank and the uh, inlet proportion which is higher at the same direction. So you would have the smoother flow that would be seen in that direction. But ultimately what you have to understand is, is the higher amount of the total head gradient that we see and this head gradient how do we calculate? So we have what we call as the head gradient is the change in the height divided by the length of the sand tube that is present. And this is something that we would be using later when we would be talking about the amount of flow as well. So this is a very fundamental way to understand the direction of flow. The next important thing is the amount of flow. So before proceeding to amount of flow, I repeat again, the most important point that you need to remember is you are trying to do changes with the pressure gradient and the elevation head and whenever you are talking about the direction it would be a combination of the pressure gradient as well as the head gradient so together the pre pressure and the elevation would give you the total head and that would be the direction of flow so groundwater would flow from a higher head to a lower head always and this is a very simple experiment that we try to demonstrate to help you understand the next important is the amount of flow now when we are talking about about amount of flow let's say the sand tank has this diameter so you would have the water that would flow through whole of this now there is in term, there is nothing it's open and it's a clear channel so it would have a huge amount of water that would flow through it but this channel let's say has intermittent sand particles what would happen you would have the area that would definitely change here and this change or uh, the change that would be seen would be affecting the amount of flow so amount of flow we say is determined by a formula where we focus on the hydraulic conductivity and the head gradient the hydraulic gradient which is also known as the hydraulic head gradient and the hydraulic conductivity and then the area which is the diameter which is considering taking the diameter of the channel through which it passes on before understanding this further you have a simple relation that the amount of flow would be directly proportional to the area through which it is flowing but it would be inversely proportional to the length of the column that is there however it would be directly proportional to the square of the diameter that's very very true or the square of the radius that's true again and it would be directly proportional to the difference in the head gradient so the inlet and the outlet being connected and the difference between the head gradient of the inlet and the outlet so h1 minus h2 and that's the difference between the head gradient and that's where you have a direct relation with the amount of flow that is seen but a very interesting thing comes up here is a question for you where i uh, believe that what would happen if this head gradient is extremely steep when this uh, head gradient is extremely steep, what would be the situation? Now, you would be definitely uh, by a kind of intuition, you can answer this, that when you have a very steep gradient, what would happen? The fluid would have enough energy to accelerate despite of any kind of resistance that is being provided by the particles of the sand that is present and it would try to go downwards but here is where you have inertia that comes into play and since inertia comes into play in this scenario you won't have Darcy's law that would be applicable because the head gradient is not in a linear fashion or is not dissipating linearly with the distance that we can say so whenever we can say 
that inertia becomes important it's that the darcy's law starts to fail despite of the fact that the flow of the channel would still remain laminar it's not that the flow has changed to turbulent the flow is still laminar but still despite of a laminar flow due to a very steep gradient higher inertia comes into play and that inertia fails the darcy's law and this is a very important exception that you need to understand for the darcy's law turbulence would come only when you would have higher velocity or changes in the pressure or density that is seen over time so uh, the darcy's law as we discussed is very very important to understand two of the concepts first is the direction of the flow the second is the amount of the flow however the fact that it was discovered to understand the flow of water through through the sand filters this law is highly applicable to ground water studies in the present day so we would be covering a lot many topics on ground water and hydrogeology stay subscribed have a wonderful day ahead